Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jim Plummer, the Dean of the Engineering School, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here this afternoon. We're here to celebrate Morris Chang as one of the engineering heroes. And this is a program that's been going on for uh, three years now. We have about 28 or 9 engineering heroes. And these are people who have a strong affiliation with Stanford. Many of them are our graduates. Others are faculty who've served here for a while. But they're people who've changed the world in various ways. So we'll talk a bit more about Morris in just a second. But, but let me begin by um, recognizing several other people who are here. Uh, John Hennessy, who is uh, president of Stanford University, um, also an engineer, um, and... <laughs> <laughs> And in just a couple of minutes, uh, Jensen Wong uh, will we'll get up and make a couple of remarks about uh, Morris as well. And Jensen is also an engineer, in <laughs> fact, a, uh, a Stanford engineering graduate. So. <clears throat> So unlike many of our uh, previous uh, engineering hero, my wife also. I, 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 I'm going to get the selfie, right? Okay. That was that was actually in my next paragraph here, but uh, <laughs> anyway, but I'll do it again. Good. So I also wanted to um, uh, note that most of our Engineering Hero events actually have been evening events, but this one is actually being held as part of a regular Stanford class, uh, the Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders uh, class. And so we're delighted to have all of the students who are part of that class here to help us celebrate uh, with, with Morris this afternoon. We have also a number of uh, TSMC executives here. We're delighted to have all of you with us. And we also have a number of people from the Global Semiconductor Association, including uh, Jody Shelton, uh, who was helpful to us in organizing this event as well. So the way uh, we're going to proceed this afternoon is that uh, the main event will be a conversation between John and Morris. Uh, we'll leave time at the end for questions uh, for those of you in the audience who might have interesting questions or comments to make. Um, <clears throat> but I did want to say a couple words about the, uh, about the Engineering Heroes program before we do that. So as, it's, as I said, there are, are roughly 29 uh, people we recognize to this point as uh, heroes of the School of Engineering. Uh, the latest class of people includes um, the founders of Google, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, uh, Sally Ride, who was an astronaut and a proponent of science education, and historically people like uh, Fred Turman, uh, Bill Hewlett, Dave Packard, and Vince Cerf are also on our list of uh, engineering heroes. As you go out the auditorium at the back, uh, to the right there's a wall there that has a plaque actually for each of our engineering heroes. So Morris uh, is a Stanford PhD uh, in electrical engineering and, uh, oh, I, 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 since you got me off track I forgot the paragraph. Um, so I did, I, I'm sorry, I, did, I'm sorry. I did want to recognize not only your wife Sophie but also Jensen's wife Lori. And we're delighted that Lori could also be with us. So Morris is a uh, electrical engineering PhD from Stanford, um, and he's, uh, Jensen will say a bit more about him, but he is, I think, best known worldwide, really well known worldwide, for transforming the semiconductor industry. And it was, a, in some sense, a single idea he had back in the 1980s that made this big transformation. And at that point in time, uh, people, companies that designed semiconductor silicon chips and so on, by and large, had their own fabrication facilities, big factories, so they would design them and make the chips. And Morris had this key insight that, you know, maybe uh, with these factories getting to be ex as expensive as they are, perhaps we could actually share the manufacturing facilities and enable more people to build these things that perhaps couldn't afford to build their own semiconductor factories. So that was the origin of uh, TSMC, which is the company that today is clearly the world leader in building chips for what are called fabulous uh, semiconductor companies. Now the consequence of that has really been transformative because not only did it result in uh, lower costs for many companies, but it resulted in a wave of uh, creativity and innovation because people could now start a company designed to design semiconductor chips and do it with a few people and, and count on a manufacturing arm at TSMC to actually build the components that they would think about designing. So he, he transformed in, in a very real way the semiconductor industry and I'm sure John will talk a little bit about him, uh, talk a little bit about that uh, with him this afternoon. 
So uh, with that brief introduction, uh, let me ask Jensen Wong, who is a uh, graduate of the also electrical engineering department uh, here at Stanford, just to say a few words uh, because he knows Jensen, he knows uh, Morris really quite well and he was gonna say a few words about his relationship with him. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, first, of, first of all, uh, both Jim and John, uh, uh, Professor Plummer, Professor Hennessy, that is, <laughs> excuse me, uh, were both of my professors. And um, I don't know if any of you have been so uh, fortunate to have been taught by either of them, but I, I am rather the product of your work. So if you're... And you don't hold if it you're, against us. If you're, <laughs> So th this is what it looks like when we grow up. Okay, we can okay, Jim. <laughs> uh, Morris, the world is full of successful people, frankly, but heroes are rare. And I think that we understand the difference between the two. There is a difference between success and impact. And I'm really, I'm really glad that, that this is partly a class because I think that Moore's, uh, his career, his philosophies, TSMC, its strategies, its core values is absolutely a study in industrial revolution. There is no question about it. And all of you who are interested in starting companies, changing the world, uh, building things that matter, uh, this, this is a wonderful study in that. Um, impact. There are very few companies that I know, that any one of you know, in fact, who has had a greater impact on society as TSMC. <coughs> when I met Morris almost 20 years ago, the concept of building semiconductors, the concept of building a chip, starts with build a factory. The first thing you do is find R&D engineers, um, find enough money to build a factory, and if you have any money left, you would actually build a new application, a new chip that mattered. What Morris, Morris did with TSMC, his insight, was instead of being a product company, TSMC would be a platform company. It would build no products. It would enable other companies to build products. That insight, all, although so clear now, potentially one of the most sustainable semiconductor manufacturing business models going forward, the foundry business model, was absolutely unclear then. Was absolutely unclear then. If you look at their impact today, uh, over 20, some $30 billion in sales, almost 1,000 customers, instead of manufacturing one or a few products very, very well, they manufacture umpteen thousand products at a time. This is a company that manufactures, that makes something that I have utmost confidence right now as I speak that every single person in this audience has in his possession. This is the only company that I know that at this moment, there's something in your position, possession right now that is manufactured by them. I believe that to be a test that will pass. Whether you have an iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy or an iPad or whatever it is, of all of the companies you know in the world, this is the only company that currently has something they make in our possession right now. There are no others. So there's basically AIR and TSMC. <laughs> I, believe, I believe that passes the test. That by Confucius? <laughs> <laughs> I believe that passes the test of impact. But what's really amazing is this. What's really truly amazing is this. I, I, met, I met Morris when I was quite young. Um, and in fact, uh, I've known Morris my entire uh, company career. NVIDIA today wouldn't be here 
um, if and, and nor nor the other thousand fabulous semiconductor companies wouldn't be here if not for the pioneering work that uh, TSMC did. And the pioneering work is not semiconductor manufacturing. The pioneering work is the strategy of semiconductor manufacturing. They decided there would be a platform company. And in that platform company description, technology matters, capacity matters, pricing matters, delivery commitments matter. But the one thing that I took away from our meeting, and I, I tell everybody this, almost 20 years ago, was when I went to see him uh, in Xingqiu, my walk away message was one thing. This is a company that had technology, they had capacity, their wafer prices were relatively low, uh, they promised to deliver on time. But my takeaway, because it said so in the brochure, it said so in all of my conversations with Morris, and it says so in, in everything he said over and over again, was what's gonna make TSMC great is integrity and trust. And it sounded at that time, when I first met you, Morris, and don't take this wrong, sounded a little cliche. Because everybody says that. But here's the fundamental difference between what he said and what he meant and why it was so important to TSMC. If you are a platform company, and you are a platform by which other companies' dreams are built from, if they can't trust you, you cannot be their platform. It's no different than the ground we stand on, a foundation we stand on, a continent we build, we immigrate to. If you can't rely on the fundamental foundation of that country, that infrastructure, that platform, you can't build an ecosystem above it. 20 years later, TSMC is not only a great company, I've already talked about its impact, but its business philosophy has become so foundational to an entire industry, whether it's EDA companies or um, IP companies that are in the audience or fabulous semiconductor companies. There are no industry, no company, no products that I know of that TSMC is not somehow uh, involved in. And it came from that singular vision that trust and integrity was foundational to their business. Um, let me just give you, tell you a couple of stories. Uh, I, I've known Morris a long time, and, and um, I, ha I have a lot of business stories, but they're not very interesting. Uh, I, have, I have some uh, personal stories that I think you'll find interesting, and it says something about his uh, commitment and his courage. Uh, hard, to say, hard to tell which one is which at the moment as I tell you the story. You decide. Um, I think it was 19, 1990. 1999. You will know the date, but I think it's like 1999. And it was a Friday afternoon. Um, I got a phone call. My admin says, uh, uh, Morris would like to drop by to see me on a Friday afternoon. And it was like my, my last meeting, and, um, I, and, and I was expecting uh, TSMC sales to accommodate him, uh, but he showed up by himself. Uh, it was him, his pencil, and his black book. Uh, uh, every time he pulls out his black book, it always sent chills through me. Um, <laughs> I, not, 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 because, not because he needed it. Uh, for everybody who knows him, uh, he's impeccable with numbers. He's impeccable with numbers. Uh, he probably still remembers uh, how many wafers I needed that year. But he dropped by, and, and he wanted to see me. Um, and we talked, and he asked me about business and the new products, and and um, uh, my wafer needs for the year coming, and, and he wrote it down, and we had a nice chat, and he left. Uh, nobody at TSMC knew he came. Uh, I found out later uh, that he was uh, checking up on his customers, and um, uh, in this case, it was me, and, and um, uh, he was on his honeymoon. And, and I, 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 am one of, I am one of the few people in the world that can say uh, I, I was with Sophie and Morris on their honeymoon. <laughs> That's my first story. I can't tell if it's a story of commitment or courage. Hard to say. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to 
pick a good story that example or both. Or both. <laughs> Uh, the, my, my second story was, um, this is just a few years ago, and usually Morris uh, sends an email and says he'd like to, like to chat, and then we talk on the phone, and um, he's, he, uh, he uh, had an announcement, and this, this announcement is um, uh, that uh, he is uh, going to have a career change. Um, he is going to be the CEO of TSMC again. And um, I and and at first, at first I was uh, happy for him. Uh, and, well, I pretended to be happy for him, and and the first thought was, isn't there a driver's license that you have you need for to be a CEO of a company? And he's turned thir- seventy-five. This is a guy who can write on his resume, when I was seventy-five, I applied for a job as a CEO and got it. <laughs> And <laughs> Who's the chairman of the board? <laughs> <laughs> and and I, you know, I, I think that there are many CEOs in the world. There are many successful people in the world, and um, and we all love what we what we do and we love what we built. But very few people at the age of seventy five or maybe it was seventy six uh, comes back to take on a massive company with global scale uh, with just in the middle of industrial revolution, which is during the mobile revolution. And not only that, uh, he delivered what I would estimate to be the best five years of his career. And it's a little bit like Jack Nicholas two weeks ago saying, you know what, I think I'm going to finish all the rounds of the Masters and win it. Uh, so this is this is an extort. Don't forget, being a CEO is, as as you know, of a large enterprise, is mentally, physically, challenging. I mean, this is a full contact sport, and um, to do it uh, to do it now and to do it the way that you've done uh, is really really extraordinary. Morris, I want to say on behalf of everybody here that we've seen a lot of success over the years, but we've never seen impact like what you've made. And um, on behalf of all of us, you're my hero. Well, after that, I'm not sure what else we have to talk about. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) But let's start with the point that Jensen made, the tremendous impact that TSMC has had. Not only uh, the creation of the fabulous semiconductor uh, industry that I think couldn't exist without without that leadership, but also the tremendous impact it had on the Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing and really being the spearhead for the growth of that industry. Did you anticipate those kinds of changes when you began the company? Did you think you could have that kind of impact around the world? No, uh, not at all, John. Actually, um, the uh, very... Uh, idea, the, the new business model, uh, the pure play foundry business model. Uh, now everybody uh, thinks that uh, it was a pretty clever idea, uh, but at the time it was really a solution that was looking for a problem. Uh, uh, because um, as uh, Jensen said, it was a, it was meant to be a platform. The problem was that at the time nobody needed that platform. There were very few fabulous companies in existence at that time. There were maybe twenty some fabulous companies. Now even those fabulous companies did not think that they needed a TSMC. You know? but they 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 felt that they would rather go to Toshiba, NEC, Hitachi, Fujitsu, or even Intel, or TI for uh, fab service, foundry service. Now, of course, I mean, those big guys, uh, the, the uh, Japanese companies, the Intels and TIs, uh, really didn't want them, you know. And they would make stuff, make wafers for for the, the little fabulous companies 
only at a, a very steep price, not a financial steep price, but the price of wanting their designs uh, for their own sales, for their own product sales. But still, uh, we were not trusted enough, our technology was not trusted enough uh, that uh, they would uh, come to us. So, uh, uh, and the big companies obviously didn't need us. Now, so it was a solution waiting for a problem to happen. Now, the, the problem happened uh, pretty quickly uh, in the early 90s. Uh, and I think that our existence certainly uh, uh, helped uh, to accelerate the formation of a lot of fabulous companies. Uh, there were maybe 25 fabulous companies in the whole world in 1985, 86, and then 10 years later, there were 400, 500 fabulous companies. And some of the big ones uh, were started in that period, in that 10 year period. Yeah. I mean, ha having worked in a fabulous company, been involved in starting two of them, one before TSMC that had to do exactly as you say, go form partnerships with the big players who this was not their primary business. And then forming one at Theros with TSMC. It was yeah. night and day. Yeah. Completely different yeah. kind of experience. Right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right. I so know. Talk, about the, talk about the impact on Taiwan as well. I mean, the, the catapulting of, of Taiwan into the semiconductor manufacturing business in a big way. I, I think in many ways uh, we uh, were the first in Taiwan. Uh, we, we were not the first uh, semiconductor company in mm. Taiwan. Taiwan had uh, other semiconductor companies uh, before TSMC started. Uh, but uh, uh, we certainly became the most successful semiconductor company uh, in Taiwan uh, after a few years, uh, after only a few years. And uh, also, uh, uh, we, I think that uh, we, we really set a model, uh, I hope, uh, uh, for Taiwan in corporate governance, in um, uh, innovations. Uh, um, uh, you know, most, most, almost 95, 90, Nine percent of Taiwan companies operate with uh, hair thin gross margin. You know, mm. gross margin four or five percent, uh, and uh, they don't have money for R and D. They don't even have money for sales marketing. For for heaven's sake, with four or five percent gross margin, and, and uh, we, I believe, were the first company that showed them that uh, uh, to to be a world-class company, to be a real successful company, you needed to have R&D, you needed to have good sales marketing, and, uh, and because you needed to have R&D, your gross margin would, ha would have to be in the 40, 50% range. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, I think we set the first example. And on corporate governance, uh, you know, I believe that we uh, we set an example also. Uh, uh, so I think uh, TSMC uh, did uh, 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 begin to acquire a, a, a different meaning in, in, in Taiwan as a corporation. Yeah. So uh, tell me, I think Jensen alluded to this focus, and you said it too, pure play. This focus on manufacturing excellence Mm -hmm. on R&D and manufacturing designed to bring new semiconductor uh, lines to, mm -hmm. to uh, production faster. H how did you uh, get decide to focus on that? How did that become the central focus point for TSMC? Well, uh, because um, one thing, one reason, in fact, maybe the principal reason was that uh, um, I, at the time I started a TSMC, I had already worked in the industry, semiconductor industry, for 30 years. Right. I, I, I joined the industry in 1955 and started the TSMC in 1985. Uh, 
And I had already been uh, the head of the largest semiconductor operation business in the world, Texas Instruments. Yeah, right. yeah. So um, uh, there was a, a, a Song Dynasty Chinese poem that said that, that uh, to be the leader, the first thing you have to do is to climb to the top of uh, a high building and look down on all the available roads in the world. And I, I, I did that actually at TI. Uh, I, I occupy perhaps the most, the height, the height of the industry yeah. and, and looked at the, the, all the available routes. Uh, and there wasn't really any for a newcomer to <laughs> compete, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to figure out a new road. Uh, and the new road was this new business model. Yeah. But then, of course, the problem was that it was a solution looking for a problem. But happily, the problem occurred. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I think... And Jensen the, was, was one of the problems. Yeah, you know? that's right. Well, sure, one of the yeah. good problems that occurred. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you undersell this point, Mars, because there were some earlier attempts at silicon foundries, but they had mixed business models. They were CAD tools combined with companies that had manufacturing lines, or they, and they never put the focus on manufacturing excellence. I think Jensen hit on trust. You want you yeah. want your customers for to trust yeah. TSMC. You yeah. better be manufacturing yeah. excellence. Yeah, I uh, that certainly, and I, I I mean I owe a lot to uh, a, a lot of people. Uh, I I owe a lot uh, to my uh, my own uh, f family, my own early upbringing, uh, which uh, did uh, instill in me uh, values of uh, integrity and uh, being. Trustworthy and uh, and uh, so on. I owe a lot to the education uh, I received. Uh, Stanford uh, uh, and uh, Stanford. I although I spent only two and a half years. Well, I should I must mention Harvard and MIT yes, as well. Right. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> exactly. And uh, but but uh, but the, the the two and a half years I spent I spent at Stanford getting my PhD. I think were. Uh, very important years, decisive years for me, uh, because um, I I had started to work already in the semiconductor industry before I came to Stanford for my PhD, and I I, ha I have to say now that before I started working, my studying at MIT was really not serious. I, I really didn't know what I wanted in life. <laughs> but then I started working and I knew what I wanted now uh, when I came to Stanford. I have been at TI, I've been in industry for six years already uh, and I have been at TI for three years and I was on the rise at TI. Mm. And they sent me to Stanford to get my PhD. I already knew what I wanted, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was a very, very diligent and serious and hard-working student. Uh, <laughs> that was the, the only time I was a hard-working, diligent, <laughs> serious student. <laughs> So I'm sure the students would yeah. like to know the secret of finishing a PhD in two and a half years. <laughs> Be, being diligent and how working. Good, good, good. It's the right answer. <laughs> so tell me how the pieces of your education fit together. As you said, you were at Harvard first, and then you you switched to MIT. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then and then and then went to work before you came here. Yeah. How did how did, what happened there? Why did you switch from Harvard to MIT? Harvard's not such a bad place to get a degree from. <laughs> not at all. It was in fact uh, even even now I consider that to be my most ex exciting year. Uh, uh, it was uh, I was freshman. I just spent the freshman year. But remember, the time was uh, 1949 to 1950, mm. and uh, there were very, very few um, Chinese. Um, uh, there were there was no Chinese 
American, Chinese American uh, politician. There was no Chinese American, even businessman. Uh, there were Chinese uh, American uh, laundry people. There were uh, Chinese American restaurant people. Mm. Uh, 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 now, the only um, uh, really uh, serious uh, profession, I would say middle class profession, that a Chinese American could uh, pursue uh, in the early 50s would be technical, you know, mm -hmm. research or, or development, uh, engineering, engineering work. Yeah. So, Although, although Harvard uh, was, at first, was a very exciting year, uh, but the Harvard didn't even have engineering as, mm. as, a, spe as a specialty. Uh, uh, Harvard, the, un the undergraduates were, were general education. Mm. I didn't think I could um, uh, find a, a job, a, a good job anyway, uh, if I uh, got a bachelor's degree at Harvard. Uh, so I... I <laughs> <laughs> we probably would have still let you in, Morris. <laughs> well, so, so I switched to uh, MIT the second year. Uh, uh, and I, I switched to mechanical engineering, yeah. Oh. And then, uh, as I said, I, I really wasn't all that interested in, in mechanical engineering or in engineering uh, uh, at all. I, I was a lot more interested in in politics, business, uh, economics, general things, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why Harvard was far more interesting to me than MIT turned out to be. But I, I, uh, I actually, I went on, of course, anyway. And in fact, I wanted to get uh, a PhD at MIT. Mm. However, uh, I failed uh, the PhD qualifying exam. <laughs> And uh, they, they allow you to take it twice, you know. Uh -huh. uh, I think it's the same rule at Stanford there. Yeah. Yeah. They allow you to, to take it twice, and mm -hmm. I, fail, I fail both times. <laughs> so what was I to do? Uh, and I decided that uh, I would just go to work. And um, I was uh, kind of sick and tired of mechanical engineering anyway. <laughs> so I, I went to work for a new semiconductor company. Uh -huh. Sylvania. Uh, and uh, then uh, after three years at Sylvania, the new semiconductor division of Sylvania, uh, uh, after three years, and I remembered one classic address that the general manager of that division gave to all his uh, indirect employees. And, uh, and there were maybe 150 of us uh, well, we were gathered in the uh, cafeteria, and uh, he said he made uh, one classic comment that I remember to this day. He said, our trouble, our trouble at Sylvania is that we cannot make what we can sell, and we cannot sell what we can make. <laughs> <laughs> now, ever, ever since then, I've tried to stay away from that. <laughs> At TI later, <laughs> and of course at TSMC, yeah. and I've, I've, I should say, I've successfully stayed away. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why TI yeah. and TSMC around <laughs> Sylvania isn't. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell me about tell me about the time when you first when you first returned to Taiwan. Uh, you headed I first, Ytre, I first right? went to went to Taiwan. Taiwan. Yeah, right. Yes, went to I, Taiwan. I, I, Taiwan right. was a strange place to me. Uh, uh, a new place, a That's strange right. place, uh, when I first went there in 1985, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, and that was the first time you had actually been there? Well, I had visited it a okay. few times, yeah. But, mm -hmm. So you returned to head ETRI, to head this uh, industrial right. uh, group that yeah. the government had. Right. Yeah. Tell me about that time and how that influenced your view of the semiconductor industry and what could happen in Taiwan. The, uh, you mean Itri? Uh, it, at Itri. Itri had had um, a semiconductor uh, uh, pilot line, uh, actually semiconductor development uh, project 
for 10 years, uh, mm. uh, ever since 1975. Uh, from 19, in 1975, the, the Premier of Taiwan, the Prime Minister of Taiwan, had the foresight to uh, start a semiconductor development project in Taiwan, in Itri, in this uh, Industrial Technology Research Institute in, in Taiwan. And uh, it, get, it got its uh, technology, well, it sent out invitation for bits uh, uh, for people, American companies, to transfer technology, semiconductor technology, to, to, to Italy. And there were several bidders, and uh, the winning bidder was uh, RCA. Uh, um, so um, Italy got its uh, technology, early technology, CMOS technology, uh, from uh, RCA. And then from that point on, uh, they started to follow, uh, uh, to continue to, to develop their technology. The problem was that it was only a development project. Mm. So uh, the RCA technology was about one generation old anyway, one generation behind when it was transferred to Italy. And uh, then when I arrived in 1985, which was 10 years after they started, uh, they had become two generations behind. Mm. Uh, I mean, in spite of their very hard work, but uh, you know, they just couldn't keep up with the, with the, the technology progress that, uh, a, uh, a, that most other semiconductor companies uh, in the U.S. at that time did. Um, um, so we, we started, TSMC uh, started with, with that technology, with the ITRI technology which was two generations behind the current technology. But uh, we managed to, um, to start to uh, catch up. Uh, and uh, I would say that it took us perhaps uh, 10 years, uh, the first 10 years of TSMC. And now, of course, you know, we, had, we, we start to have uh, enough business volume to support a a, a much higher level of R&D mm. than Itri could. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. So how did you, the thought of starting a semiconductor manufacturing company and the capital that requires seems quite daunting. How did you, how did you get that company launched? Well, uh, the government uh, first promised to be, the, to be uh, a 50 percent, the, the largest uh, investor, 50 percent up to 50 percent. And uh, so it was my job to get the other 50 percent. Mm. Of course, uh, it turned out that uh, even though the premier promised uh, that uh, the government would invest uh, 50 percent in TSMC, I still had to get the bureaucracy's uh, uh, <laughs> agreement, uh, which, which took uh, actually uh, not, not just a few months, but also a lot of uh, heartache. Yes, you know, yeah. patience uh, of a saint. Patience, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, of course, uh, the harder part, of course, was to get the other 50%. And, um, uh, and the premier told me that I needed to get a, uh, a, uh, a technology, a uh, multinational technology company to be uh, an anchor investor. Mm. Uh, and then if I, if I get this uh, uh, multinational technology uh, company uh, to be the anchor investor, then uh, it would be easier. He would help me uh, to get the rest uh, from Taiwan business community. So I spent about, about uh, eight months uh, to get uh, Philips. Well, actually, I had written letters, letters to a lot of people, Intel, TI, mm -hmm. uh, Toshiba, Hitachi, NEC, um, Sony, uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, and uh, actually uh, three companies uh, uh, gave me uh, 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 presentation opportunities. Intel mm -hmm. did, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote to 
Gordon Moore and uh, Gordon wrote back said uh, that uh, he said that uh, I I have asked uh, Craig Barrett, hmm? who was at that time his uh, uh, CTO I think, uh, uh, to see me. So I talked to uh, Craig twice, uh, two separate occasions. But uh, at the end of the uh, second occasion, he said, "No, we're not interested." And Ti the same way. Uh, Saw him twice. Saw Ti twice. I went to Dallas uh, twice, uh, and the same way. Uh, at the end of the second meeting, he said no. Mark Shepard said no. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Too bad for him. Huh? <laughs> well, uh, and uh, then, but the only company that uh, appeared to be interested. Uh, Genuinely interested was Phillips. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, uh, and uh, well, I I had wanted uh, somebody better in technology, and uh, Phillips, in terms of semiconductor technology, I I had described them as being um, in the first row of second raters. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I had to settle. I had to settle for them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So I, I got them. I got them. Uh, and they invested 28%. So I had uh, 48%, it turned out to be 48% from the government, Taiwan government, 28% from uh, Phillips, and then the remaining 23, 24%, I guess, I got from, from about 12 or 13 companies. Uh, and that was very interesting too. What, what generally happened was that uh, one of the ministers uh, in the government would uh, call uh, a businessman in Taiwan and uh, told him that uh, uh, he would send me to give a presentation to that uh, businessman mm -hmm. to get him to invest. So I was on that kind of trip, so, you know, a dozen times. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, and there was uh, one pretty big investor, a 5% investor um, that, uh, that actually bought uh, when the Minister of Economic Affairs in Taiwan first called him and told him that uh, he wanted to send me, he said okay. Mm -hmm. So I went there actually three times, three separate times. Um, and uh, I mean, he and, he, had, he and his staff uh, sat down with me for dinner, and uh, none of the, those people knew anything about semiconductors. <laughs> but they would, they would keep quizzing me, you know, at dinner, and I, I didn't even, I wasn't even able to, I didn't even have time to eat anything. <laughs> but, and the, it was, you know, twice. This happened two times, dinner two times. Dinner and interrogation. <laughs> for two times. And then he called the uh, Minister of Economic Affairs, the, uh, the, big, the big businessman, called the minister back and said, no, 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 I'm not going to invest. Well, the minister, of course, uh, was unhappy, but uh, he, 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 he told the premier that. The premier said, let me call this guy. And so the premier told me later that he, he, he called uh, this guy. Uh, and uh, he, he, the premier also told me, uh, he said, I told him, the government has been very good to you in the last 20 years. You better do something. You better do something for the government now. <laughs> <laughs> well, that works. That works. That Any works. way you can get the that money, works. I guess. It's, that uh, worked. Yeah, that worked. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, when you look at this, mm -hmm. you look at what's happened historically, it's mm -hmm. really fascinating because in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, I think it, it, there was this thought that Japan would take over the entire semiconductor industry. Yeah. And in fact, that, hasn't what's, that has not been what's happened. In fact, there was the rise of TSMC and Taiwan semiconductor industry, then main, now mainland China, Korea, obviously. How have you? How did this? How do you see what what really caused this kind of evolution and these changes? Well, I, I really think that the, the problem with the, the Japan, with the Japanese industry, was that uh, they never 
uh, created a, a, a fabulous industry. Right. It was the fabulous industry in the United States that came up uh, with all the innovations, right. almost all the innovations right. uh, 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 in the last 20 years. Uh, so, I mean, there was this uh, uh, industry, Japanese semiconductor industry uh, uh, conference, oh, five, six years ago. And um, I was invited to attend, but I was not invited to participate in um, a panel uh, that they had. So the panel, the panelists were all the Japanese uh, industrialists, semiconductor industrialists, sitting up there discussing that they wanted the government to, um, to fund a common fab for them now. <laughs> like TSMC. Uh, that's what they said, you know, up on the stage. And I was sitting downstage. I, I was really getting very impatient. But, uh, and uh, then uh, finally, finally, they stopped talking. And uh, the chairman of the, of the panel asked uh, if, if the, anybody in the audience uh, wanted to make any comment. So I raised my hand. I said, <laughs> <laughs> and they all knew me anyway. I said, I don't think your problem was, uh, was not having a common fab, huh? Your problem was that you just never had a, a fabulous company. It was the fabulous companies, you know, yeah. that uh, the, the, the big difference that has occurred in the last, uh, uh, at that time, it was, I think, something like two, 2005. Between 1985 and 2005, the 20 year time period, the um, Japanese um, market share had dropped uh, 20 percent, 20 points, and the American market share had gone up 20 points. Mm. And the fabulous, in the meantime, all American, went from zero to 20 percent. Right, right. And that was the difference. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, not only did they <laughs> yeah. didn't do that, but they also yeah. didn't. <laughs> they also didn't go into the hardcore foundry business, the pure play foundry business, which they could have done. They had the technology early on. They were good at the manufacturing side, but they they decided not to do it, I guess. Uh, yeah, but well, I wouldn't have welcomed them to that. I know you would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were afraid of you, Morris. That's I, I would have welcomed them to, to create a fabulous industry yeah. that we could then Sure. No doubt. No doubt. So uh, one thing I, I I know that you also have a great uh, love and appreciation of the arts and and the humanities. You mentioned your year at Harvard. Tell me how that's affected you, your leadership, your the style with which you've led TSMC. Oh, uh, it certainly uh, has uh, made uh, my life uh, a lot more. Interesting. Uh, I uh, I do. I am interested in um, both uh, English and Chinese literature, uh, uh, and I'm I'm interested in uh, classical music. Mm -hmm. So uh, my whatever leisure time I have, I I will read uh, Chinese literature, English literature. In fact, the two books that I have. Uh, uh, very near to my bed, um, I, I, I read them uh, uh, usually, you know, in the uh, in the hour uh, uh, or two uh, uh, when I was too tired to read uh, anything serious. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the two books. Uh, one is Chinese; it's the Red Chamber Stream. Uh, it's a Chinese classic, uh, and the other is uh, Shakespeare's plays, uh, and. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the in the Shakespeare's tragedies, mm. and I mean, there's a lot of meaning. I think uh, a lot of uh, life life's lessons uh, in uh, Shakespeare's play. Uh, and I'm interested in music. I'm interested in history in general, in biography, uh, and uh, all those. I think add a great deal to uh, to to my life's interest. I think, and I think that uh, my business. Um, um, uh, experience, uh, I think, benefits from uh, some of these uh, uh, lessons uh, that I learned in outside reading, too. Uh, uh, I often compare uh, 
I, 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 I am a student of the, uh, the Second World War, the, the main battles and so mm. on. I often, often compare uh, the competitive battles that TSMC goes through with the uh, competitors, compare them with uh, the, the battles in the Second World War. Huh? Stalingrad and yeah. all the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Stalingrad, that's a tough mid, one to start with. Mid, the mid, siege of Leningrad. <laughs> Staling, Stalingrad was, uh, was yeah. the one I was very interested in yeah. because, uh, uh, well, actually the midway, uh, the, uh, the naval, naval battle. Yeah, battle, you know, the, the Japanese commander couldn't make up his mind. Yeah whether to keep the, uh, the bombers uh, on deck or uh, the fighters on right. deck. You know? uh, and he changed it. He he ch changed yeah, he changed it. Well, you know that too. Yeah. <laughs> he, changed, he changed it. And that, that, that cost him the battle. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, Indecision is a very bad thing in war is, and in leading companies. That's right. A, right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, final question before we open up the floor. Uh -huh. What advice would you give to the students who are here who seek to have some impact, have a life that really achieves, achieves great things? And many of them, will, most of them will be in some engineering discipline. What advice would you give them? Learn and think. Both are important. Uh -huh. Both are important. Very, uh, uh, very, well, here I, I go to a Confucian uh, uh, statement. Uh, learning and uh, thinking are both important. If uh, you just learn and don't think, then you quickly become lost. Uh, if you just think and don't learn, then you quickly run out of material to think. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. <laughs> Okay, let's open up the floor for, we have 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, and do we have mics or what do we have here, Jim? Okay. The conditions you describe at, at the founding of TSMC are very similar to the conditions that exist today in the MEMS industry. And I know I'm that- I'm sorry, I have a little trouble oh. hearing you. Could you be a little louder perhaps? Hello? There it is. Okay. So I was saying the conditions that existed at the start of TSMC are very similar to the conditions that exist currently in the MEMS industry. And I know that... In what industry? In MEMS. 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 Electromechanical. Uh-huh. So, and I know TSMC is doing business in MEMS now. It's a very small part of your revenue. But I was curious what your vision is for MEMS for TSMC, and particularly whether you think TSMC can standardize MEMS the way it did for CMOS technology. Can TSMC standardize MEMS? Standardize the MEMS tech base technology, I guess, right? That's really the key. Standardize? Yeah, create a standard base technology on which MEMS That's, can that's be what built. we hope to do. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, that's, that's true, isn't it? Uh, Mark, uh, Mark is uh, yeah, one of our co CEOs. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. and I I really think that MEMS uh, is a very major part of uh, what we call general the next big thing. You know, the current big thing is uh, all these smartphones and tablets, the mobile product. What is the next big thing? Well, the next big thing, I don't know exactly what it is. I I guess it's it's probably uh, the internet of things, the wearables and, and those things. Uh, but whatever, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's very probably the internet of things and the uh, wearables. Anyway, MEMS will play a big part in those. So we, we really have high hopes uh, for MEMS. Uh, TSMC has high hopes for MEMS. Well, and you, Morris, you did achieve this in the mobile industry. In the beginning, there weren't standards, particularly for the analog side of it, and you needed analog to go into the mobile business. And you did become a leader in kind of creating a standardized platform that people could design on. And That's you did right. this because yeah. you were willing to collaborate yeah. with the early fabulous companies as they came along and uh -huh. developed that standard, uh -huh. I think. It, it and, really and, and that's what we're, we're trying to do in MEMS. Uh, uh, yeah. 
So when you spun out of uh, ITRI, uh, do you think that could have been done just as a start, or did, was it really important to have a government foundation there and it kind of spun out of that? And the second question then is, is that a useful model to think in, in terms of manufacturing uh, generally around the world or especially in the U.S., uh, spinning out manufacturing capability out of our national labs? I, I really think that um, uh, the Taiwan, the TSMC, ITRI, Taiwan, um, the three were in combination. I think that was a pretty unique one. Uh, uh, first of all, I didn't go to Taiwan to start TSMC at all. I went to Taiwan to, to be the president of history. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to retire in that job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the person that recruited me to that job was a it was, was not the same person that asked me to start TSMC. <laughs> In fact, the two of them uh, were not friendly to each other, you know. <laughs> and uh, the person that eventually asked me to start TSMC uh, was unhappy because um, the other guy had recruited me to the itchy job. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, Two weeks after I arrived in the Itri job, uh, this other minister, who was unhappy because he didn't recruit me, uh, asked me to, to go to see him. And at that time, he said, uh, you ought to start TSMC. Uh -huh. And uh, well, of course, uh, he had he, he, he didn't really understand semiconductor industry very well. So when he said you ought to start a semiconductor company, he meant uh, something like the conventional IDM. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, uh, but I came up uh, with a uh, different, uh, with the TSMC business model. Yeah. Uh, different uh, game plan. Yeah, different game plan. And uh, he, he had the confidence in me because, because he knew what I had done uh, at TI. Uh, uh, so so uh, he, he trusted me. Uh, so even though he didn't understand what a foundry was, uh, 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 he, he trusted me. Yeah. So do you think it was a unique situation or could that model be more generally expanded? I think, I think it was a pretty unique situation. You, you first, uh, you, you have to start with the insight that uh, uh, the Taiwan government had uh, back 10 years earlier in 1975 when they started this uh, the seed group, uh, mm. this development group uh, in Italy. Uh, it was pretty big money for them at that time. It was, uh, you know, even just just the RCA contract, uh, the technology transfer contract, uh, was uh, four or five million dollars, which was big money for for the Taiwan government at that time. Mm -hmm. And then sustaining their own development activity, and uh, that probably cost uh, a few million dollars a year, you know. And that was pretty big money uh, for the Taiwan government, but they did it. Uh, uh. And then, of course, uh, uh, when the time came uh, when I started to set up uh, TSMC, and uh, the, the premier, the second minister, uh, and the premier said they would support 50 percent. They didn't know that it was going to be 50 percent of 220 million. <laughs> <laughs> They, they thought it was a much smaller number than that, yeah. But, but they swallowed that uh, also, so. So it, it was- I'll bet they're happy they swallowed that. Oh, yeah. They were, they, oh yeah, they, well they're very happy now. Maybe. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Recently, um, some people claim that um, beyond 20, uh, 28 nanometers, the cost per transistor is not going to scale. They say that 28 nanometer is the last technology node that has and is going to have basically the lowest cost. Uh, could you comment on that, or do you do you agree with John, this? can you repeat that? The me? question is: uh, below 28 nanometers, will we get any cost improvements in the price of per transistor 
Uh, some people claim that's the end of the road in terms of price drops per transistor. Well, uh, I think it, it, it does become more difficult, but I think uh, it will still happen. Now. now, I think there's a controversy going on, and uh, whatever, um, but uh, I would say that um, uh, it will continue to happen. We'll still get lower, lower cost transistor, maybe not the decrease in, in cost maybe will not be at the same rate right. as it happened before, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Uh, Chairman, considering yeah. your love for literature, is there an autobiography in the works? <laughs> what? Is there an autobiography in the works? Well, actually, I wrote one in Chinese, in Chinese. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was a bestseller uh, in Taiwan. In Taiwan, uh, yeah. it, appropriately uh, so. <laughs> well, it was the envy of a lot of professional writers uh, in Taiwan. Huh? Uh, uh, we sold uh, almost 200,000 copies, which, was, uh, a, which constituted a very good seller in, <laughs> in Taiwan. And in fact, I had, a trans I had a translated it into English by a couple of professional translators. But I didn't like the translation. I didn't like the result. Uh, and Shakespeare uh, wasn't available, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't publish it. I didn't publish the English version of it. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Hi, th thank you. Um, I think you'll like this one. Um, any advice to a startup that spe specializes in buying and selling primarily uh, secondary uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment on uh, <laughs> how to start a new relationship with TSMC? A startup that specializes in buying and selling of, of used semiconductor yes, equipment? Yes, yes. And we just actually started oh, a new office in Taiwan. I have to think about that. <laughs> I, I think I, I, I do think there's a market for that. Yes. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, even even today, if uh, we we be interested in buying uh, some uh, used uh, equipment, uh, uh, but uh, but whether I I would advise um, uh, a startup like that, uh, I I don't know. I have to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a market for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a market. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a market. Other questions? Yes. So I have a question. Reading, if you read Macbeth just before you go to sleep, doesn't it give you nightmares? <laughs> <laughs> Thinking of the witches there. Well, yeah. I, I generally, uh, even though I'm, I'm primarily interested in Shakespeare's uh, tragedies, but for bedtime reading. Uh, Romeo and Juliet a lot. Well, that's a tragedy, too, I guess. Or, or perhaps The Merchant of Venice. Yes, anyway. okay. There we go. There we go. Yeah. I represent the uh, fabulous industry. We started a company, a semiconductor company in Connecticut. Uh, the name of it was Transwitch. We used your foundry. Uh, and it uh, worked out beautifully. Uh, it's a wonderful business model to have fabulous. Uh, in in your capabilities, and as you point out, it's key to the industry itself. But I want to thank you and keep up your foundry. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I also, before we we finish, I also want to say that uh, uh, the uh, Jensen actually referred to. Uh, by being on uh, honeymoon uh, when I talked when I visited him. The year, by the way, uh, uh, was not 1999. <laughs> it, it, it was uh, 2001. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, but uh, what I want to say is that uh, ever since then, you know, uh, I think Sophie's support has been very, very important. And when Jensen refers to by last five years, my last five years being the CEO again uh, of TSMC. Uh, actually, I didn't become CEO again at the age of 75, as you said. I became CEO again at the age of 78. <laughs> 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 but, 
But anyway, last uh, 10 or 11 years, uh, uh, well, uh, actually 13 years, I think Sophie's uh, support uh, was uh, most significant. Uh, I must Picking your right, the right life partner is another important oh, yeah. lesson oh. one can learn in life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well said, John. Well said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For you, Morris, uh, I was, it's a non-technical and non-business question. How do you kick your smoking habit? I know you used to smoke when you were in graduate school. How did I kick it? Yeah. How do you kick it? Or you have ever kicked it? I haven't. I really haven't kicked it. No. <laughs> uh, you know, my my philosophy on smoking is this. I, I smoke a pipe, by the way. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I know that uh, pipe smoking, well, pipe smoking, I think, is better than than cigarette smoking. I, in fact, I have read statistics. Yeah. But say, it's not in the good column, Morris. It's not in the good column? <laughs> no. Uh, well, it's better. That's, that's what you say. But the statistics I saw say that a pipe smoker actually lives longer than a non-smoker. Really? Yeah. <laughs> And I, the way I see it, the way I this see it. This is in a journal for pipe smokers, I'm sure. <laughs> the way I see it is that while uh, pipe smoking is uh, injurious to your physical health, but maybe it helps your mood. Maybe yeah. It, yeah. You, yeah. And, and I, I think that a person's uh, mood is very yeah. important yeah. to his health. You know. <laughs> I, I try a nice <laughs> glass of red wine. I think. <laughs> That's right. That's All right. right. Let's get another question here. So Dr. Chen, I have a question. Um, now everybody knows, you know, these data integrated circuits process, you know, the circuit design complexity is getting higher and higher, so the process is more complicated. But at the same time, the consumer electronics side are demanding, you know, faster time to market, being able to deliver a product in a shorter life cycle. So in your view, how do, how do you or, you know, what would be the challenge facing forward and balance out the, these two different requirements that are coming I'm, in, in I'm the... Sorry. John, maybe you can. I, I think the question revolves around um, the complexity of circuit design and logic design now with these complex chips has become really significant. I mean, look at Jensen's products, for example. And yet there's demand to deliver products in ever shorter periods of time. How do you see those two really meshing together and being resolved? Well, I, I think that uh, there is a tendency that uh, the uh, fabulous companies uh, uh, are, con are consolidating. You know. I think there'll be fewer uh, in uh, five years uh, or ten years. So uh, they are, they are, I think some of them uh, uh, will be acquired by others. So, so do you think we'll see a model? Jensen will be acquiring people, right? Yeah, he'll be, be buying people, right? Yeah. I mean, will a model emerge? I mean, if you look at how Intel does design, they have multiple teams working sort of in a, yeah. in a leapfrog fashion, yeah. one yeah. after the other, because the design takes so long, and yeah. perhaps we'll see more of that emerge over time. Yeah. Okay, we have one more question. Hi, Dr. Chen. Uh, I have a question about your decision uh, of going back to Taiwan. Um, you were a really very successful uh, person in PI uh, back in 19... 85, and what do you see in Taiwan that makes you give you the courage to go back to Taiwan? Well, I uh, felt that, um, uh, well, actually at TI, I did not achieve uh, what I wanted to achieve, uh, which was the CEO job at TI. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he only headed the entire semiconductor unit, but it... <laughs> uh, so uh, now, uh, by uh, 1983, uh, I was actually told uh, very plainly that I would not be the CEO of TI. So I left in that year. I went to General Instrument mm. in New York um, to become their COO with the expectation that I would become the CEO 
in perhaps uh, three or four years. Uh, now, after a year, however, in general instrument, although I still could be CEO in another two or three years, but I decided I would not want to be the CEO of general instrument. Mm -hmm. So I was now at uh, a crossroads. Uh, uh, I was in a company uh, when I really, where I really didn't want to, to be the CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now at that time, uh, Taiwan began to beckon. Uh, so I decided that that would be a, a, a good, uh, it was it was a, a risk, but uh, you know uh, I was uh, about uh, I was fifty four years old. I felt I could still afford to take uh, a risk, uh, 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 and uh, I had achieved uh, a measure of financial independence uh, uh, with my uh, TI and the general instrument. Uh, uh, stock options, all that sort of things. Uh, uh, it's nothing like uh, what you would consider wealth today, you mm. know. But uh, financial independence to me meant at that time that uh, I didn't need a job. Uh, uh, I, mean, could, I could just live on the interest of, uh, of uh, my, uh, the money I had, uh, which, which was true, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, interest rate was actually higher at that time too. <laughs> <laughs> but still, uh, still, I, I, I did have a financial independence, uh, so I decided to take a risk. Uh, yeah. uh, and that road less taken is what turned you into an engineering hero. I think it's yeah. really remarkable. <laughs> Thank you. One more really quick question. Mm. So, I hope it's a good one. <laughs> I hope to. Uh, segueing from your point about the CEO, so what are the top three things or five things, whatever you want to share, you feel is would be important for a CEO? Or, I mean, maybe in a corporate and in a startup. Top three or five things that you think are important for being a great CEO. Oh, I. Of course, it uh, depends on uh, what kind of company you are CEO of. Um, if uh, if if it's, you talk about uh, a a reasonably big company, um, it's, let's say ten billion dollars and up kind of company, I think a CEO's main job is to bring the outside to the inside. Uh, out, the outside is uh, you know customers, shareholders, society, the world. Uh, bring the outside to the inside and maximize the inside performance to cope with the outside. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the main job. Yeah. She always that's a really insightful comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to just finish up by <clears throat> um, telling Morris that uh, th those of you who have been outside the back of this room and gone to the right will have seen a, a wall that has uh, plaques like this on it for each of the engineering heroes. And so this is a replica for Morris of the plaque which is now hanging out there on the wall. So I'd like to thank uh, Morris and John and Jensen. This has been a thoroughly interesting conversation. There is a reception outside uh, back for those of you here in the auditorium. Those of you watching over the internet will we'll have to presume that you aren't going to be here, but um, <laughs> th those of you who are here, please uh, continue with us outside in the, in the reception area. And thank you all for coming. I, I am rather the product of your work, so if you're and you don't hold if it you're, against us. If you're, <laughs> so this is what it looks like when we grow up. Okay, we can okay, Jim. <laughs> uh, Morse, the world is full of successful people, frankly, but heroes are rare. And I think that we understand the difference between the two. 
there is a difference between success and impact. And, and I'm, really, I'm really glad that, that this is partly a class because I think that Moore's, uh, his career, his philosophies, TSMC, its strategies, its core values is absolutely a study in industrial revolution. There is no question about it. And all of you who are interested in starting companies, changing the world, uh, building things that matter, uh, this, this is a wonderful study in that. Um, impact. There are very few companies that I know, that any one of you know, in fact, who has had a greater impact on society as TSMC. <clears throat> when I met Morris almost 20 years ago, the concept of building semiconductors, the concept of building a chip, starts with build a factory. The first thing you do is find R&D engineers, um, find enough money to build a factory, and if you have any money left, you would actually build <clears throat> a new application, a new chip, that mattered. What Morris Moores did with TSMC, his insight, was instead of being a product company, TSMC would be a platform company. It would build no products. <coughs> it would enable other companies to build products. That insight, all, although <coughs> so clear now, potentially one of the most sustainable semiconductor manufacturing business models going forward, the foundry business model, was absolutely unclear then, was absolutely unclear then. If you look at their impact today, uh, over 20, some $30 billion in sales, almost 1,000 customers, instead of manufacturing one or a few products very, very well, they manufacture that a little cliche, because everybody says that. But here's the fundamental difference between what he said and what he meant and why it was so important to TSMC. If you are a platform company and you are a platform by which other companies' dreams are built from, if they can't trust you, you cannot be their platform. It's no different than the ground we stand on, a foundation we stand on, a continent we build, we immigrate to, if you can't rely on the fundamental foundation of that country, that infrastructure, that platform, you can't build an ecosystem above it. 20 years later, TSMC is not only a great company, I've already talked about its impact, but its business philosophy has become so foundational to an entire industry, whether it's EDA companies or um, IP companies that are in the audience or fabulous semiconductor companies. There are no industry, no company, no products that I know of that TSMC is not somehow uh, involved in. And it came from that singular vision that trust and integrity was foundational to their business. Um, and let me just give you, tell you a couple of stories. Uh, I, I've known Morris a long time and, and um, uh, I, ha I have a lot of business stories but they're not very interesting. Uh, I, have, I have some uh, personal stories that I think you'll find interesting, and it says something about his uh, commitment and his courage. Uh, hard, to say, hard to tell which one is which at the moment as I tell you the story. You decide. Um, I think it was 19, 1990, 1999. You will know the date, but I think it's like 1999. And it was a Friday afternoon, um, I got a phone call. My admin says, uh, uh, Morris would like to drop by to see me on a Friday afternoon. And it was like my, my last meeting, and, um, I, and, and I was expecting uh, TSMC sales to accommodate him, uh, but he showed up by himself. Uh, it was him, his pencil, and his black book. Uh, uh, every time he pulls out his black book, it always sent chills through me. Um, <laughs> I, not, 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 because, not because he needed it, uh, for everybody who knows him, uh, he's impeccable with numbers. He's impeccable with numbers. Uh, he probably still remembers uh, how many wafers I needed that year. But he dropped by and, and he wanted to see me. 
Um, and we talked and he asked me about business and the new products and I'm team thousand products at a time. This is a company that manufactures, that makes something that I have utmost confidence right now as I speak that every single person in this audience has in his possession. This is the only company that I know that at this moment, there's something in your position, possession right now that is manufactured by them. I believe that to be a test that will pass. Whether you have an iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy or an iPad or whatever it is, of all of the companies you know in the world, this is the only company that currently has something they make in our possession right now. There are no others. So there's basically Air and TSMC. <laughs> I, believe, I believe that passes the test. Is that by Confucius? <laughs> <laughs> I believe that passes the test of impact. But what's really amazing is this. What's really truly amazing is this. I, I, met, I met Morris when I was quite young. Um, and in fact, uh, I've known Morris my entire uh, company career. NVIDIA today wouldn't be here um, if, and, and nor, nor the other thousand fabulous semiconductor companies wouldn't be here if not for the pioneering work that uh, TSMC did. And the pioneering work is not semiconductor manufacturing. The pioneering work is the strategy of semiconductor manufacturing. They decided there would be a platform company. And in that platform company description, technology matters, capacity matters, pricing matters, delivery commitments matter. But the one thing that I took away from our meeting, and I, I tell everybody this, almost 20 years ago, was when I went to see him uh, in Xingqiu, my walk away message was one thing. This is a company that had technology, they had capacity, their wafer prices were relatively low, uh, they promised to deliver on time. But my takeaway, because it said so in the brochure, it said so in all of my conversations with Morris, and it says so in, in everything he said over and over again, was what's gonna make TSMC great is integrity and trust. And it sounded at that time, when I first met you, Morris, and don't take this wrong, sound Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jim Plummer, the Dean of the Engineering School, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here this afternoon. We're here to celebrate Morris Chang as one of the engineering heroes, and this is a program that's been going on for uh, three years now. We have about 28 or 9 engineering heroes, and these are people who have a strong affiliation with Stanford. Many of them are our graduates, others are faculty who've served here for a while, but they're people who've changed the world in various ways. So we'll talk a bit more about Morris in just a second, but, but let me begin by um, recognizing several other people who are here. Uh, John Hennessy, who is uh, president of Stanford University, um, also an engineer, um, and... <laughs> <laughs> And in just a couple of minutes, uh, Jensen Wong, uh, we'll, we'll get up and make a couple of remarks about uh, Morris as well. And Jensen is also an engineer, in <laughs> fact, a, uh, a Stanford engineering graduate. So. <clears throat> So unlike many of our uh, previous uh, engineering hero, my wife also. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get the selfie. Right. Okay. <laughs> that was that was actually in my next paragraph here. Oh. But uh, <laughs> anyway, but I'll do it again. Good. <laughs> So I also wanted to um, uh, note that most of our Engineering Hero events actually have been evening events, but this one is actually being held as part of a regular Stanford class, uh, the Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders uh, class. And so we're delighted to have all of the students who are part of that class here to help us celebrate uh, with, with Morris this afternoon. We have also a number of uh, TSMC executives here. We're delighted to have all of you with us. And we also have a number of people from the Global Semiconductor Association, including uh, Jody Shelton, uh, who was helpful to us in organizing this event as well. 
So the way uh, we're going to proceed this afternoon is that uh, the main event will be a conversation between John and Morris. Uh, we'll leave time at the end for questions uh, for those of you in the audience who might have interesting questions or comments to make. Um, <clears throat> but I did want to say a couple words about the, uh, about the Engineering Heroes program before we do that. So as, it's, as I said, there are, are roughly 29 uh, people we recognize to this point as uh, heroes of the School of Engineering. Uh, the latest class of people includes um, the founders of Google, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, uh, Sally Ride, who was an astronaut and a proponent of science education, and historically people like uh, Fred Turman, uh, Bill Hewlett, Dave Packard, and Vince Cerf are also on our list of uh, engineering heroes. As you go out the auditorium at the back, uh, to the right there's a wall there that has a plaque actually for each of our engineering heroes. So Morris uh, is a Stanford PhD uh, in electrical engineering and, uh, oh, I, 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 since you got me off track I forgot the paragraph. Um, so I did, I, I'm sorry, I did, I'm sorry. I did want to recognize not only your wife Sophie but also Jensen's wife Lori. And we're delighted that Lori could also be with us. So Morris is a uh, electrical engineering PhD from Stanford, um, and he's, uh, Jensen will say a bit more about him, but he is, I think, best known worldwide, really well known worldwide, for transforming the semiconductor industry. And it was, a, in some sense, a single idea he had back in the 1980s that made this big transformation. And at that point in time, uh, people, companies that designed semiconductor silicon chips and so on, by and large, had their own fabrication facilities, big factories, so they would design them and make the chips. And Morris had this key insight that, you know, maybe uh, with these factories getting to be ex as expensive as they are, perhaps we could actually share the manufacturing facilities and enable more people to build these things that perhaps couldn't afford to build their own semiconductor factories. So that was the origin of uh, TSMC, which is the company that today is clearly the world leader in building chips for what are called fabulous uh, semiconductor companies. Now the consequence of that has really been transformative because not only did it result in uh, lower costs for many companies, but it resulted in a wave of uh, creativity and innovation because people could now start a company designed to design semiconductor chips and do it with a few people and, and count on a manufacturing arm at TSMC to actually build the components that they would think about designing. So he, he transformed in, in a very real way the semiconductor industry and I'm sure John will talk a little bit about him, uh, talk a little bit about that uh, with him this afternoon. So uh, with that brief introduction, uh, let me ask Jensen Wong, who is a uh, graduate of the also electrical engineering department uh, here at Stanford, just to say a few words uh, because he knows Jensen, he knows uh, Morris really quite well and he was gonna say a few words about his relationship with him. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, first, of, first of all, uh, both Jim and John, uh, uh, Professor Plummer, Professor Hennessy, that is, excuse me, uh, were both of my professors. And um, I don't know if any of you have been so uh, fortunate to have been taught by either of them, but 